Hey guys, this is Fred from Pretty Fly Games, and today we're going to continue with our top down car controller built in Unity. During this tutorial series, we've created a bunch of components which is required to make a racing game. Now we're going to focus on how to combine them and make a complete racing game. But it's going to be without online multiplayer support, so we've actually reverted the project back to part 11. So let's start by making a copy of the spawn car scene. So let's open that and then let's save the scene as and go into scenes and we'll call it course one. So this will be the first course that we'll be creating, which will be the complete game where you can race around. And for that, we will need AI cars. So I've taken our AI car project and I've imported the car AI handler, the waypoint node and the A star scripts as well. Great. Now let's open our prefabs and go into cars and open our main car prefab. Uh, in here we want to add the car AI handler. Uh, and we also want to use the A star light script. Uh, so uh, the car AI handler and the car input handler will be competing against each other because they will both try to provide steering input for the car. Uh, so we need a selector when we are spawning the cars uh, that should either use the car input handler or the car AI handler. They can't be used both at the same time. So we need to create that when the car is spawning. And the same thing for the A star light. We only want that to be used by AI cars. Uh, but let's see that this just works. So let's save everything and uh, let's uh, start the game and we will have a couple of cars spawning. And uh, then let's go into this car. Uh, oh, I grabbed it. Playback, okay, so the first car. Let's disable the car uh, uh, input handler. And uh, we will keep the car AI handler and we will change it to follow mouse and keep the A star script. All right, so uh, now we can see that uh, that this car is following uh, the mouse and uh, we can also uh, control another car with uh, the keys with there we go uh, so now we have ai car uh, that are actually working and we also have uh, a player that uh, can be controlled by the player awesome then let's go into build settings and make sure that uh, our course one scene is enabled and let's move that up into the list. So it's the first uh, thing that will be launched when we're launching a build version of this. Okay, perfect. Then we'll go into another script. So let's open scenes and go into our menu scene. All right, let's zoom into our canvas like that. Then let's go into build settings and press add open scene again and move the menu up first. So when the game is launching, we want it to start from the menu. Perfect. Then we want to change a thing, a few things here. Uh, so let's go into our menu script, scripts UI. And uh, then we have uh, our select car UI handler. So let's open that. Then in our game, we want uh, the players player one car to be uh, the player's car and uh, player two, three and four are going to be AI cars. So we need to control if they are going to be controlled by the player or the AI. Uh, now, as I said before, you can use a game manager for this uh, to keep track of uh, the settings, etc. Uh, but uh, we are going to keep it very simple and still use our player prefs. So let's create a new player pref. Let's do a player pref set int and then we'll call it p1 is ai and uh, we're going to set it as zero so that means player one is ai is zero so we're using that as a boolean so zero will represent false and one will represent true then let's do the same thing for the p2 uh, except the P2 is going to be an AI player. So let's set it as one and do the same thing for P3. And ultimately the same for P4. 
great. And then these AI cars, we don't want them to look the same as the player's car. Uh, so from the car data, we're not going to take the selected car index. Uh, rather, we're going to pick a random car. So let's do a random range. I'm going to go from zero to size of the car data's length. And uh, that's going to give us uh, an index that is going to be uh, a random value between zero and the size of our car data. So that will make sure that the AI car gets a random car. Let's replace those. And uh, let's save that. Oh, and actually we need to change the scene manager load scene. We want it to load course one because that's what we're calling it now. So right, course one. Now let's save. Then let's go into spawn cars uh, because this is going to determine if it's going to be an AI car or not. Uh, so uh, first of all, we are not only going to spawn player cars. So let's remove player car and just call it game object car. And then uh, let's uh, store this value because we are going to need what player number it is. So uh, integer player number is i. So we loop through our spawn points that we have. So it needs to be exactly four spawn points in the scene if we are going to have four players. Then we provide, uh, add one to it. So uh, the first spawn point is going to have player number one. Second spawn point is going to have player number two. And uh, then we need to replace this player car with car. And uh, then we need as well to determine if it's going to be a AI car or not. So we are checking our player prefs. We are getting an integer and we are taking the P because it says P1, P2. Uh, and then it has is uh, AI and it's going to be equal to one if it is AI. So uh, we are injecting the player number here. So it will say that P1 underscore is AI. Uh, perfect. So uh, we have uh, our code that is going to be executed if we uh, actually are an AI. Uh, so if we are uh, an AI, what we want to do is we want to set our car input handler to be disabled. Then we also want to add a tag so that we know it's an AI car. So let's take a car and assign the tag AI to it. And if we are not an AR, then it means we are actually a player. And in that case, we need to do a few things. First of all, let's take our car AI handler and disable that. And then we want to take our R star light and disable that. So we set it to enabled equals false. And then we want to tag it as the player. Okay, so let's save that and try that in Unity. Then we need to define our tag because we don't have a, a tag uh, called AI. Uh, it's not here. So let's go and add tag AI. And uh, the player, we already have that because there is going to be a player tag here. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, take our game for a spin. And let's select the, well, let's select the yellow car. doesn't matter which car you select. So now that uh, the game is running, oh, let's uh, actually find our course. Red, there we go. Uh, we can have a look at the different cars. So we have our, our car, uh, yellow variant here. And uh, it has uh, the tag player. So this is going to be the player's car. And we can see that uh, it's actually the car AI is, is disabled and the A star is disabled. And then we have the blue car here, which uh, should then be an AI car. We can see that it has the tag AI, which is perfect. And uh, it has disabled the car input and it's actually uh, moving. And it's following player, but uh, there is some errors. So let's just change it to follow mouse and uh, then uh, we can take the other two cars and do the same thing follow mouse and then we can uh, well let it run so we can see now that the ai cars are uh, 
following as they should and we can control the player's cards. So now we have actually our selector where the player can select a, a car and the AI will pick a, a random car and then race. Some of the scripts that we have created in previous episodes expects the cars to already be in the scene. So when they are spawned by the spawn handler, it means that uh, they are um, actually not discovered. As an example, we have the position handler that actually uses the car lap counters and it's called in the awake function. That means that the cars have not been spawned yet, so the position handler will not be able to find the car lap counters or not all of them. And it becomes very hard to control the execution order because we are not sure in what order they are called by Unity. So this is something we can change. If we go into edit and project settings, and then we have the script execution order here. And uh, what we can do is we can add a, the plus sign and then we want the, the car spawn handler uh, to be called earlier. So spawn cars, we have that now it's, this is the default time and now it's called 100 milliseconds after that. And we don't want that. So we want it to be called ahead of it. So let's add it to minus one. So this means that the spawn course will be called before all default time or any other script that is here. Uh, so by doing that, saving it or applying it, then we can make sure that the other scripts will function correctly. Then let's go back into our scene. Let's open our scenes and go into course one. Uh, so now we have our oops, course one here and uh, we want the AI to be able to race around it. So we need to add our um, well waypoints to this script. So let's uh, go ahead and create a empty game ob object. We can actually add it as an empty child, doesn't matter. And then let's zero out, so it's on zero. And uh, let's uh, rename this to AI paths. And uh, from this, let's create a child object and uh, we need uh, the AI root to be under it. So that's going to be our um, nodes or our waypoints that are going to be under this script. And for them to actually draw, we need to have our draw path handler. Oh, hold on. What did we call it? <laughs> AI. Uh, ah, I've forgotten to copy it. Uh, so uh, I need to grab that script uh, called uh, draw path handler. Uh, so hold on a bit. All right, so let's drag and drop our draw path handler in there. And uh, let's have a Unity compile it for a little bit, and then we can add that. Uh, and let's add itself to it, so it's AI root. Uh, great. So now we can start to add uh, the waypoints under this. Uh, so let's add our empty child, and uh, we'll call it waypoint node. And uh, let's attach the waypoint script to it, waypoint node script. And uh, uh, then we can position it. So uh, the cars are starting here, we're driving in this direction. Uh, so let's duplicate this one, and uh, let's see something like that. And there, and there we go. Okay, so uh, for them to draw, we actually need to connect them. So we have the next waypoint node here. So it's going to be a size one. Uh, so from this, it's going to select the next node. Perfect. So now we can see that it's drawing. And then let's do that for all of them. Uh, size one. Perfect, something like that. Uh, the only thing we need to make care, be careful about is uh, the AI cars are going to select uh, the first node is going to be, well, the, the one that is closest to the uh, to where they spawn. So if they spawn over here, it means that uh, they are actually going to, um, well, select this node. So uh, for, to not actually change that in the code, we're gonna cheat a little bit 
we're going to change uh, this level. Uh, so that's what all good uh, level designers do. When there's a problem with the code, they change uh, the how the level looks, right? Uh, so let's go into our uh, our spawn points and select them and move them up. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at that first waypoint. So now for sure, this is going to be the selected as the first waypoint. Then let's go into our prefabs cars again, select our car. And uh, the car AI handler, we don't want it to follow player. We want it to follow waypoints and we can have it as, uh, well, all the other things can be as it is. And then we can save and now we can try it and see how it works. So we can see that our AI cars are uh, running around. Well, at least they are trying to and they're jumping and some of them uh, got stuck here. And uh, then they are trying to resolve that uh, with our their A star mechanics uh, or script. And uh, yeah, they're sort of finding the way. But uh, let's uh, edit the level a bit so it becomes a little bit better and uh, well easier for the AI's cars to handle this. Uh, so let's have that jump and let's remove these uh, duplicates and we can still have those blocks. Uh, and what we can do as well, we can take our waypoint here, we can drag it up a little bit. So it, uh, when they are taking the turn, they're going to well see this and then uh, skid uh, or uh, slide down a little bit and then actually hit the, the jump in a better way. And we can bring this up a little bit as well. Well, I mean, you can tweak all the waypoints uh, as you want, but now they will uh, have a bigger chance to actually hitting this um, uh, jump here. Uh, otherwise, they are most likely going to go around it this way. So now when we are playing the game, the, the car starts here and the AI starts to move right away. Uh, but that's not very sort of fair because as soon as uh, the level loads, the AI will just uh, speed up and race ahead of the player without giving the player any chance to really get into the game and react. Uh, so in total arcade racing, we have uh, these uh, red lights. First they are red and then they turn green, like racing lights. Uh, but for this game, we're gonna create a simple like countdown, three, two, one, go, and then the, the race starts. So let's start by creating the UI for that. And we already actually have a UI called uh, uh, in-game canvas. So let's reuse that. We can just grab it and uh, add it to the scene. And because we are starting to make multiple levels after this, let's also uh, make the camera into a prefab. Uh, so any change we make into the main camera, uh, we are, well, it's easier to change that. Uh, all right, awesome. So let's have a look at our in-game uh, UI. And that looks like this. And we have also our touch input if you want to uh, use those. But for now, we're not gonna use that. And we're actually not gonna have the leaderboard showing all the time. So let's hide that as well. Then uh, let's add a new canvas to our game for the countdown part. Uh, so let's create a game object UI canvas and make it a child. And uh, let's have it fill up 100%. So it fills all the way. Uh, so we're stretching everything in all directions. And then we change the margin so it covers the whole screen. And make sure that the scale is, is 1. All right, so now we have our canvas here and we can rename it so we know what it is. So we'll call it countdown canvas. And let's create a UI text game object as a child. And uh, let's have that stretch as well to all of the extents. And scale is one, perfect. And then uh, let's uh, have it much larger, like size 300 maybe. Let's make it white so we can see it and then it's going to be like three two one go uh, so let's put it in the center of the screen and uh, I mean it's the regular text effect and uh, yeah we can still make it look a little bit better so let's add an outline to it and uh, I don't know maybe two three minus three something like that 
uh, and let's make it 100% solid. All right, so now we have our countdown canvas. It's going to show up in the beginning of the game uh, or when we load a level, and it's going to be like three, two, one, go. Uh, so we need to have a script that handles the countdown and also then hides this when we're done with it. Uh, so, but let's apply this to our prefab because I was changing it in not in the prefab mode. So let's override, add override, apply all, uh, so that everything gets updated properly. And uh, the canvas, we can either have it so it's visible as a start with the three, uh, which uh, is fine, and then we can change that in the code. So usually I, I leave like canvases open or actually with, with the number instead of uh, like removing it uh, like this uh, because this is how it's going to look like when it starts but then i usually forget that i have some kind of element and then i forget about it so i usually remove this through code so it's going to be like three two one and then go uh, awesome uh, so we need to create a new script and let's go into ui and we'll call it um, Countdown UI handler. And let's uh, bring that to our canvas once Unity has compiled it. Uh, right, there we go. And once again, I, I didn't change this in prefab mode, so we need to apply it. Perfect. Uh, Awesome, so uh, let's open uh, that in Visual Studio and get cracking with it. So let's uh, start using uh, Unity Engine.ui so we can access the text uh, component and then we'll create a new variable public. Um, it's gonna be a text and it's gonna be called countdown text. And when we are uh, awaking so as before the render loop is even called uh, we are going to uh, make sure that the text is set to nothing uh, so it's empty all right and then we can get rid of our update function and uh, for this we are going to use a coroutine all right so we're going to call that countdown and the first thing that we will do is because the scene has just loaded and the player doesn't know what's going on we're gonna wait for 0.3 seconds to give the player a chance to actually see what's going on and then we will have the counter that goes like three two one go right and uh, we need to reduce this counter to zero or to go uh, so we'll do it through a while loop and uh, we don't actually need a variable here we can just break this val while loop when we're done so uh, uh, what we will say that okay if uh, if our counter is not zero so it means that uh, it's um, well something else then we are just going to take the counter and convert it into a text so we'll use a two string and uh, <clears throat> if it is zero uh, then it means that we are going to display the go because we're not going to, going, going to go three, two, one, zero, go. So instead of zero, if it is zero, then we are going to use the text go and we are also going to break this while loop. Uh, and the reason why we are breaking it early is when usually when you display, display the last thing like the go, uh, a, a player doesn't want to wait a full second before they can actually sort of drive and this text disappears uh, so what we will do is uh, we will uh, make it a little bit shorter on the last one uh, but let's finish our, our code for the three two one countdown at least uh, so the counter needs to be decreased in this loop and then we need to wait for a second I mean you can make it less than one second but let's have it as real seconds uh, so then we're gonna wait for one second and then we're gonna run the loop again wait for one second until we reach zero because then we are going to display go and uh, then let's uh, wait a little bit more so that the go text can stay on the screen for 0.5 seconds 
And after that, let's uh, hide the whole game object. So this is attached to the canvas, so that's gonna hide the whole canvas. Uh, so now we need to run it. So in our start function, let's start our coroutine. Awesome. Uh, so let's save that and go into Unity. So let's open our prefab this time and do it the right way, or at least what I think is the right way. And uh, let's go on our countdown canvas and drag and drop our text into uh, the inspector slot there and save it. And now we can take it for a spin and see how it behaves. Uh, so we have our three, two, one, go. All right, awesome. So that uh, works. But the cars are, are driving, of course, because we haven't told them to do anything different, although we have this nice countdown now. Uh, so now actually it becomes uh, logical to create our game manager so that we can have a script that is controlling the game state and what is going on. So let's go ahead and create a new script and we'll call it game manager. And uh, Unity already knows that sort of this is an important script, so it uh, gives uh, this little cogwheel icon to it. Uh, let's open that in Visual Studio. So let's get rid of our update function because we won't need that. And uh, then we are going to do what a lot of games do. We are going to make this into a singleton. Uh, and a singleton means that there can only be one of these scripts running at the same time. And uh, we are also going to make use of the function in, in Unity so it doesn't get destroyed. Uh, so, first of all, let's uh, make a public static game manager instance. So other scripts can access it by writing a game manager instance and then blah, 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 whatever. Uh, so that's an easy way for scripts to access the data in the game manager. Uh, but we also need to make this into a singleton. So let's program that. So in the awake function, we need to do some things first. So we're going to check if our instance is null. Uh, if our instance is null, it means there is no other version running. There is no other script of a game manager. So in that case, we're going to say, okay, this is actually the first time it's running. So we're going to say that the instance is this. Uh, so after that, it has been set. Uh, but if there is already a game manager instance running, then it means that we are trying to load it again, but there should only be one. Uh, so, if our instance is not equal to this, uh, then it means that we can destroy it. So let's go destroy game object and then we return. And the reason why we are returning here is we don't want any other code to execute after this, because there should only be one game manager. Alright, so now that we have established that yes, this is the first instance, it's this we are running. Uh, then let's use our do not destroy on load uh, so this object stays forever in, in Unity. Uh, awesome, so let's save that uh, for now and uh, let's. Uh, we need a way of us also instantiating this object so uh, we need to make sure that it's loaded. So let's go save this and go into Unity again. So now we need to create a new object for the game manager. So create empty and let's right click reset position on the transform. Call it game manager and add our game manager to it. There we go. Uh, so uh, this uh, will uh, need to be added to each scene if we do it this way, uh, which is a little bit tedious uh, because I mean um, if we're starting this level uh, then we need to have a game manager but if we're coming from the menu screen we need to have the game manager uh, so what you can do is instead use a loader or um, a way of instantiating the game manager whenever unity starts up regardless of what scene is being used so we're going to do a little bit uh, of a trick here so let's go into resources let's create a new folder and we'll call it uh, not game manager. Hold on, sorry. Create new folder, uh, and we'll call it instant 
instantiate on load. Uh, and we'll make the game manager a prefab in here. Uh, and then we can get rid of this one. So now we're going to create a special script uh, that loads anything in this folder or actually instantiates anything in this folder. So let's create a new script and uh, let's call it uh, startup. Nope, not a new folder, a new script. And let's open that in Visual Studio. Let's get rid of our start and update function. And uh, we are going to use a special um, uh, feature in Unity. So it's called runtime initialize on load method and runtime initialize load type before scene load. Uh, so anything after this is going to be executed uh, by Unity, uh, regardless if it's in the scene or not. Uh, so it's going to run even if we don't have a, a sort of a game object uh, on this. We don't need to attach this to a game object. In fact, we don't need it to derive from mono behavior at all. So we can get rid of that to make sure that we actually don't drag and drop it into uh, something on the scene, in the scene. Uh, so uh, let's add a debug log so we know what's going on. Log, and uh, let's say that we are um, instantiating, instantiating, instantiating global objects or Uh, and then we can do uh, something like that so it sticks out a bit. Uh, awesome. And then when we are done with it, let's uh, wrap that and say that it's done. Okay. So then we want to instantiate objects in here. And to make it easy, we are going to grab our uh, resource folder we're going to load everything in it of the type game object in instantiate on load and we're going to call it prefabs to instantiate and it's going to be an array of game objects and then we run a for each loop on it like that and uh, that's going to uh, execute everything or uh, run uh, a loop around everything that is in this array uh, let's write a debug log saying that creating prefab.name so that's going to write out that we're creating it or instantiating it well let's call it create and then uh, we are going to create it by just doing a game object instantiate prefab and then we are going to be done with it so uh, yeah, it can be simplified, it doesn't matter. Uh, so let's just instantiate the prefab and uh, when we are done, we are done. Uh, so let's save that and uh, run uh, our scene in Unity and see what happens. So if we go and have a look at the console, we can see that instantiating objects and creating game manager and instantiating objects done. Uh, so this code was running even though we haven't attached it to our C. So that's a very nifty feature in Unity that you can use for game managers and other things that you need to sort of instantiate once and have them running. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's stop our code from running our game. So now we can make our uh, game manager a little bit smaller. So let's open our game manager in Visual Studio. And uh, our game manager, we want to have um, some way of controlling the state. Uh, so let's create a enum game states. And we're going to have, uh, well, some game states. Countdown, running, race over. Uh, so that we can uh, determine what is going on. And uh, this is going to be used as any variable, really. So uh, we're going to call it game. Um, uh, we're going to create a game from game states. We're going to call it game state, and it's going to have the game state countdown. Uh, 
as a start. Now since this script is running as a singleton and it's alive all the time due to do not destroy on load, we have to be a little bit careful about setting the state and controlling it. Uh, because if we are, um, let's say that we have uh, uh, started a level, it's in countdown and then it's running and then we uh, complete the, the, the race and it goes into uh, race over, uh, then load another scene then it will remain as race over because uh, this code uh, is only executed when it's actually being created. Uh, so we want it to execute uh, or actually be able to reset these states every time a new uh, level is loaded. Uh, so we're going to use scene manager. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to use uh, the scene manager. So let's do using uh, unity engine.scene manager management. And uh, then we are going to use an event uh, for this. So we are going to use on scene loaded. Uh, so this is uh, an event that we can listen to and that gets called. Uh, however, we need to as well subscribe to that event. And uh, it's, it's a little bit of a special event, uh, so um, or actually the event is uh, not very special at all. It, it just the timing of it. When are we going to uh, get this called? And uh, the easiest way is to say that okay, when uh, when we have when we are enabled, uh, we are going to get uh, an event called on enable. So when this script is en enabled, we want to subscribe to on scene loaded. Uh, so in that case, we will say that, okay, our scene manager is going to have the scene loaded. When this happens, we are going to get this event. We're, so we're subscribing to this event. So this is code is going to be executed when the scene is loaded. Uh, so what I usually do is I call the, I make a function for this called uh, level start. Uh, and on our scene loaded, we will call level start. And in our level start, we can reset uh, these type of variables. So game state is going to be count on whenever a new level is starting. So that's an easy way to reset our variable. So as well, let's add a debug log uh, so we can see what's going on. Debug log and level started. Uh, now other scripts needs to access this game state. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, let's uh, give them access to that. And uh, there are various ways of doing it. You can do it through a getter or setter or um, yeah. I will just make uh, a script uh, called uh, uh, it's going to return a game state and it's going to be called get game state. And uh, it will return a game state. And we need to make it public so other scripts can see it and access it. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, save that and go back into Unity. So to be able to actually stop the cars from moving, they need to only be allowed to move when the game is in a certain state or rather when it's not in a state, which is the countdown state. Uh, so we want to change that. So let's go into scripts and uh, let's uh, open car and let's open our uh, top down car controller in Visual Studio. So now in our top down car controller, Let's go into fixed update and uh, we are going to say that if the game manager dot instance get game state is equal to game state countdown, then we are going to return. So we're not going to run any code if it's in this state that will uh, prevent our cars from moving while the countdown is going on. So if we would run this code now, it wouldn't be very exciting because the cars would just stay still all the time. So let's open our game manager again and uh, let's uh, make another public variable or public function uh, and let's call it on 
uh, race start and uh, it's going to be a void so we're gonna sort of fake our own event it's not a true event uh, but let's uh, actually move it down here so we'll keep all the sort of events on the bottom part of our script uh, so on race start it's going to take the game state and put it into game state running so who is going to call this script well we're going to call it directly from the countdown ui handler uh, so the countdown ui handler when we have written the text go then we will actually allow the cars to start moving so let's go game manager oh, not game states game manager instance on race start and actually let's go back into our uh, uh, game manager and add a debug log for it so we know that it has happened uh, let's add it before we actually change the state uh, debug log on race start perfect now we can try this in unity and see if it works So now we have our countdown, no car is moving and way they're driving backwards and then they're going forwards and we have some ghost data and we can drive our yellow player car. Uh, so the reason why they are going backwards as a start is because the AI code uh, is not aware that there is a countdown feature and uh, they think they are stuck. Uh, so they have the instruction to uh, reverse if they are stuck. Uh, so that's why they are starting with the driving backwards. Uh, so now we have the initial part of uh, our code running where uh, we have a game manager that controls the game state. I'd like to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. It helps us with every single contribution that we can get. So please uh, consider supporting us on Patreon. The link is in the description. This concludes this episode and I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and the bell to get a notification when the next video is out. Here's an example from our game, Total Arcade Racing, which uses this component for its physics, inputs and other parts. You can find the game on Steam, Xbox and Nintendo Switch, please take it for a spin if you want.